This is a documentary about addiction. It's a multi-part series that will cover all of these other types of addiction. They are categorized by constructive and destructive addictions. We will cover destructive addictions, alcohol, drugs, shopping addiction, gambling, sex addiction, pornography, food addiction, gaming, social media addiction, addiction to violence, sugar addiction, addiction to validation, addiction to conflict, money, partying, going to doctors, gossiping, TV shows, dramas, addiction to new things, politics, sports, and exercise. We will cover constructive addictions. Exercise is in both categories, meditation, religion, self-improvement, food, but healthy food, gardening, charity work, volunteering, playing puzzles, peacemaking, healing, encouragement, information, God, and fruit. Anything can become an addiction and even constructive addictions can turn destructive if overused and if it interferes with daily life. Destructive addiction is the spiritual sickness that prevents a person from being able to stop doing something that is causing themselves harm or another person harm. It is demonic possession. In 1 Peter 5 and 8 it reads, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for something to devour. Addiction is a spiritual attack against the human spirit. Every addiction is associated with a demonic entity. It's important for Satan to get a hold of people and imprison them with addiction so they can't hear God. So they turn away from God and he can eventually kill them. It's guest time. See if you can answer this question. What percentage of adults in the U.S. battle drug abuse disorder? Is it A, 0.38%, B, 3.8%, or C, 38%? The answer is A, 38%. That number is not accurate considering how many people actually hide their drug abuse. Galatians 5.17 in the English Standard Version, it reads, The desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. People with drug abuse disorder need to call on God. He is the only one that can break the curse of the enemy. It's best not to abuse drugs at all. No one gets a little bit high. They may get more possessed, but as soon as they take the drug, they are high. People that abuse drugs have no idea that they are making an agreement with a fourth dimensional being that will take over their body at will. These beings are violent and they want to kill the host eventually. Here is another question. How many Americans suffer with mental health and substance abuse in millions? Is it A, 0.85 million, B, 8.5 million, or C, 85 million? The answer is 8.5 million people with drug abuse disorder and mental illness. People with mental health problems usually self-medicate. They go to the psychiatrist to get a pill to quiet their demons. It works, but it comes along with side effects and they eventually stop working. The person that takes the medication also doesn't know that their demons are adaptive. They are already rewiring the person's already messed up brain. The demonic realm also goes in and unhooks the medicine. Medicine works by stopping the overfiring of the brain. It doesn't cure anything. It just stops the alarm from going off. The demons go in and turn the alarm back on. When the alarm is on, it makes the person so uncomfortable that they will do anything to make it stop again. Rob, kill, or take drugs. I never saw a happy person abuse drugs. They always seem to have something they were running from. Unhealed wounds or horrible current circumstances that they want to escape from. The circumstance is usually in their mind. In Proverbs 25, 28, it reads, Like a city that is broken into and without walls is a man who has no control over his spirit. A drug addict has three options, die, go to jail, or get clean. When they go to jail, they won't have access to their vices, and they'll have withdrawals in a crowded cell with other inmates. 2.3 million prisoners suffer with addiction. 
75% of prisoners suffer with mental illness and substance abuse. The life of a drug addict is very predictable. It leads to destruction. Satan is very crafty at getting people who already are weak in the mind. Once the drugs take hold, it's just a matter of time before they become a slave. Mental illness is demonic possession. Drug abuse is demonic possession. Addiction of all kinds appears to be different, but they come from the same source. Different vice, different demon, same source. The devil wants you to think it's different, so you pick one over the other, picking the lesser of two evils. Most drug addicts also abuse alcohol. The underlying cause of this is obsessive compulsive disorder. They obsess about their traumas, past, fears, anxieties, and they compulsively drink or get high. You can apply that same formula to all addictions. These are the places that foster drug addiction. You will find drugs at all of these gatherings. You'll also find lingering spirits waiting to inhabit all who partake. Bars, school, nightclubs, concerts, college, raves, sleepovers, and house parties. These are people that foster drug addiction. Just by association, abusing drugs will occur. Friends, family, sorority sisters, frat brothers, teammates, co-workers, love partners, and celebrities. Teenagers like to experiment with drugs and alcohol because they think it means they're grown up. They don't know that they are putting shackles around their necks. A lot of addictions occur in college. Someone is at a party, they're passing around cocaine or weed. The student starts to focus more on the drug than actual studying. They get kicked out of college, start hanging out with other dropouts at clubs all night. This way they feel less alone. I'm speaking from experience. All my friends were dropouts. All my friends quit college. We all worked at a restaurant and got paid every day and partied all night. We were losers. But when you hang out with losers, you don't feel like a loser. It was very comforting to be high with them all the time because no one was judging me. Meanwhile, my life was passing me by and so was theirs. No one cared. Five years later, I had a full-blown addiction and mental health issues that can only be described as pure psychosis. God healed me from all of that, but it was rough. The worst part was admitting I had a problem. Drug abuse is rampant. The burden of illegal drug use on the economy is $740 billion. The cost is in lost work productivity, healthcare expenses to keep them alive, and the crime-related costs of employing police, judges, public defenders, and for housing inmates. 17% of drug addicts are unemployed. 9% are employed, but are probably going from job to job, sick all the time, or stealing. I had a boss that did lines of coke every hour after each appointment. That's really scary considering he was giving people marriage advice. Here's another question. How many tweens or teens between 12 to 17 suffer from drug abuse disorder in the United States? Is it A, 7,410, B, 74,100, or C, 741,000. The answer is 741,000. Where are their parents, you might say? As a former public school teacher, I can tell you the parents were probably on drugs themselves. These kids probably came into the world addicted to something they just were never told. In my book, I describe how the mother's dopamine deficiency is passed on to the child in utero. The father's dopamine deficiency is delivered when the sperm is formed. These kids are screwed up at hello. 90% of people with addiction started before they were 18 years old. This usually happens because some other person who is imprisoned by drugs becomes a recruiter for the demonic. They can't kick the habit, so they try to make their dealer happy by bringing him more customers. A lot of times when a drug addict recruits more users, the dealer will give them a discount or free drugs. I didn't start doing drugs until I was 25 years old. It seems kind of late to screw up, but I was never going to do them. The devil caught me at a weak moment. I broke up with my boyfriend after four years, and I end up dating a drug addict next. 
All my friends were drug addicts. I just never did drugs with them. We went to clubs, but I would just drink. If you hang around drug addicts long enough, you will become one, period. When I was in high school, no one did drugs. It just wasn't around. No one even talked about it. Now kids are high in elementary school. This came from my generation. I know this for a fact because drugs weren't around. We were never warned about them fully. So when the party drugs hit the streets, we lost our minds. Some parents still partied well into their 30s when they started having these kids. The story is deeper than that, but you have to read my two books to get the whole explanation. These are the main causes of drug abuse in teens. Stress in the home, genetics 40 to 60%, addictive personality, free drugs, peer pressure, community environment, parents drug use, unhealed wounds, poor education. I was tempted not to put poor education on here because kids do use Adderall and uppers to study for tests, but that's not a smart thing to do. There are more causes. Sexual abuse, mental health disorder, depression and anxiety, too much freedom, lack of parental concern or neglect, divorce or parental separation, curiosity, glamorizing by celebrities, or escapism. When I was in the club scene, I thought of it as a way to escape what I was feeling. The lights, the loud music, the room full of gorgeous Miami people. One day I saw that place with the lights on. The floor was dingy, the wall had holes in it, the bar was falling apart. I couldn't believe how music, lights, and people can hide Satan's pit of hell. You don't have to die to go to hell. You can marinate in your own sorrows, covered up with pills and booze. You might enjoy the ride, but you won't like where it lands. By the way, there is no difference between a teen drug addict and a teen gamer. Same exact neurons firing. Both addicts. In my opinion, gaming is the original gateway drug. Here's another question. How many people drive under the influence of drugs in the United States every year? Is it A, 1.28 million, B, 12.8 million, or C, 128 million? The answer is 12.8 million. There is no age limit for doing drugs. So this includes teens. Cocaine is a nasty drug. I've immediately stopped being friends with people that escalated from weed to cocaine. Their personality changed too drastically. Me and that demon don't mix. Men seem to become violent while using cocaine. I had an ex-boyfriend throw a DVD at my head because I found his little bag. Five million Americans use cocaine. 996,000 Americans abuse cocaine. 637,000 people 12 years or older receive treatment. One in five deaths overdose on cocaine. 4% of 12th graders use cocaine. 34% increase in death in one year. You might wonder why men are more at risk of violent attack. It's because men are the most susceptible to demonic possession. For one reason only, they have two minds. One mind is in their head, the other mind is in their pants. This is not anything you haven't heard before. Nobody knows why though, I do. It's because their sperm has their own consciousness. There is something alive in a man's testicles, a billion different entities with their own agenda. That is to make it to this plane of existence by any means necessary. When he's sober, he might be able to control himself, but under the influence, they take over the will and his body is doing their will. If his testicles are infected with demonic possession, you have a billion tiny demons controlling this big giant. It's a scary thing because he becomes a predator. Heroin use has doubled in the last decade. So have the deaths. 652,000 Americans 12 years or older abuse heroin. 15,000 heroin deaths occur a year. 25% of heroin users are addicted. Alcohol users are two times more likely to use heroin. Marijuana users are three times more likely to use heroin. Cocaine users are 15 times more likely to use heroin. Opioid users are 40 times more likely to use heroin. And the most at risk are white males age 18 to 25 living in large cities. I think people that use heroin have severe mental illness. Conventional medicine doesn't work anymore and they just want to check out of this existence. 
they don't realize that it only takes one time for them to check out for good. Most heroin users will experience a close call where they have to be brought back to life. If someone is around, they might be lucky enough to make it. If not, they will have a one-way ticket to hell. I never tried heroin and never would because I can't do needles. I also don't like putting anything up my nose. I can't imagine how depressed a person must be to choose something so completely and utterly dangerous. They say you can get hooked immediately. I don't like that kind of commitment. People that use heroin are playing with the most destructive demon there is. If they don't get help, it's game over. I've seen people on intervention looking sick. That's what they call it. The drug consumes their mind. It's all they think about. That's not living. That's dying a slow death. Only the devil could come up with something like that. The people usually have no willpower to get help. They are terrified of the excruciating withdrawals. It's best to never ever try it, even once. I'd rather go through excruciating withdrawals than live a life under that kind of control. God can heal all of it though. He can do it overnight if the person is really serious. It's demonic anyway. Marijuana. 30 to 40 million Americans smoke weed a year. 4.1 million people 12 years or older battle marijuana addiction. 6% of college students smoke daily. Three times increase in 20 years compared to the whole population. 13% of 8th graders smoked weed at least once. 27% of 10th graders smoked weed at least once. 35% of 12th graders smoked weed at least once. 12% THC in the weed today compared to 1990 when it was only 4%. Most people that smoke weed are aged 12 to 25 years old. People say weed is harmless. That's a lie from the pit of hell. I was seriously addicted to smoking weed. I thought I needed it to cure my anxiety. It gave me anxiety. It got so bad I didn't leave the house for four months. I had social anxiety through the roof. Now that it's legal, people think it's safe. Anything that alters a person's mind opens them up to demonic possession. The truth is, people that smoke weed daily are severely depressed. They're just avoiding feeling these emotions. When I see these rap artists smoking blunt after blunt after blunt, I know they are morbidly depressed. Unhealed wounds coming through the roof. People look at them like they are having a high tolerance, like it's something to be proud of. It means that this person is desperate not to feel. If you dig into their past, there's a ton of old pain. Opioids are legal drugs, but they are obtained illegally and abused. They are prescriptions written by doctors that might not be honest, and the pharmaceutical industry may be distributing them in other ways. 191 million opioid prescriptions are written a year. 20 to 30 percent who use opioids abuse them. 10 percent of users become addicted. 2.1 million people have opioid addiction. 5 percent of people who abuse opioids will try heroin. 20 percent with depression or anxiety abuse opioids. 18 to 25 year olds are most likely to be addicts. In the Midwest, overdoses increased 70 percent in one year. In large cities, overdoses increased 54 percent in one year. $78.5 billion a year in economic burden of opioid abuse. Today, people are dropping like they did in the 80s from AIDS. 47,600 single opioid deaths per year. 130 people die from opioids every day. Not too long ago in middle America, these suburban kids were dying by the dozens a day. Nobody wants to say why though. It's the parents. The parents are dopamine deficient. They don't give their kids any way to self-regulate. The environment is filled with kids with unhealed wounds. Nobody wants to talk. Everyone keeps everything bottled up inside until little Timmy is dead in the garage. It's too late then. The father doesn't want to express himself. The mother is in the bottom of a wine bottle and the kid is left with all this angst. The foolish music that they listen to that has demons in the music gets into their minds and before you know it, they're looking for a quick fix. You can get addicted to opioids lightning fast. They are designed for that. An addicted customer is a loyal customer. 
the kids abuse the drugs, then the same amount doesn't work, and before long they're taking 30 pills a day to function. That's not sustainable. They think because it's legal that their life isn't on the line. It absolutely is. There are many side effects that include death. It's a gamble, and these little kids are playing Russian roulette with a pill bottle. That's probably why they made weed legal, because these kids were dropping like flies. They aren't trying to fix the problem, just give them something else. Let's talk about why we use drugs. In the last video, I talked about biochemistry. I'm going to explain it here also, because all addiction is the same. The primary causes of drug addiction are low dopamine, low serotonin, and low oxytocin. The pyramid is based on needs. The greatest needs are at the bottom. Number one is low oxytocin. Oxytocin is the chemical a person gets when they feel loved, cared for, nurtured, and accepted. It's already in the body, but it's triggered by others. Most scientists believe that people are addicted to social media for the dopamine, but I believe it's the lack of oxytocin that occurs first. They seek dopamine to satisfy the lack of oxytocin. Oxytocin is what little babies get by being in contact with the mother after birth. They feel safe, fed, safe to go to sleep, and they feel loved. Many addicts have issues with their parents. They were rejected early on, and they never felt safe. They can get oxytocin from their father also, but if he's an addict, violent, or absent, the child really needs mom to give them some stability. Number two is low serotonin. Serotonin is the well-being hormone. 90% is created in the gut, and 10% is created in the brain. A mother that has low serotonin and low dopamine will transfer this to her child. That means if the mother has a hard time staying happy, she will have an unhappy baby. A mother that has candida will transfer the pathogenic yeast to her child in utero. If the child is born by C-section, the mother will not transfer good bacteria to the baby. That means the child's system is compromised at birth. Candida suppresses serotonin. Candida eats sugar, aka alcohol. The vagus nerve is the highway from the gut to the brain. Candida will hijack the brain, triggering the person to crave drugs to get dopamine, so it can get fed directly to the brain. This allows a person to be completely controlled by their cravings. Number three is low dopamine. When the dopamine reserves are gone, meaning the drugs have left the system, the person has low dopamine. This couple with low oxytocin and low serotonin, the person uses more to get more dopamine. The way drugs work is that they block the dopamine receptor so when dopamine is released, it can't go back up into the synapses. This leaves more dopamine in the lobby, so to speak. That's why the person feels high. The more accurate term is loaded because the dopamine is backed up and can't go back where it belongs. Over time, the drug damages the receptor and it can't be used again. That means more of the drug needs to be used next time to get the same result creating addiction. In other parts of this documentary, I'm going to show you this is how all addiction works. These primary causes are rooted in childhood. They have everything to do with the lack of nurturing by the mother. People that abuse drugs are not happy people. They have unhealed wounds and they can be tracked back to an individual, an event, or a life stage. The enemy triggers these unhealed wounds spiritually and then candida facilitates the manipulation of the biochemistry to keep the person in bondage, craving that high or an escape from reality. Secondary causes of drug addiction are number one, high cortisol, number two, low serotonin, number three, high adrenaline. These secondary causes have more to do with young adulthood or adulthood. These are situations occurring in life now that is causing stress. Keep in mind, these situations could be someone's imagination. The stressors could be work-related, family-related, or related to some current mental illness they're battling. If you live in the present, focusing on the past, it causes stress. Number one is high cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone. It stays in the body longer than adrenaline. It wears a person down over time. Adrenaline is immediate stress. Cortisol is prolonged stress. When people are under prolonged stress, they tend to become depressed. They already have low serotonin because cortisol suppresses serotonin. When they feel like they're drowning, they get angry, enraged, anxious, just to pull themselves out of depression. These people are in survival mode. 
They feel that whatever the stressor is, it's a life or death situation. These are people that are spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and psychologically weak. They use drugs to survive. Number two is low serotonin. Since they had low serotonin since childhood, which goes back to unhealed wounds, this low serotonin is a precursor to addiction in adulthood. They have candida in their brain, which is why most addicts have pre-existing mental problems. It's the candida that's being fed and spreading in their brain. Since dopamine is made in their brain, the candida that's taken over and overgrown won't allow dopamine to be released naturally. They have candida in their gut, which suppresses serotonin, which is why they're craving dopamine in the first place. This deficiency makes them angry and bitter and mean because serotonin is the well-being hormone. Anger is nothing more than unexpressed sadness about not being at peace. Low serotonin leads to depression and sadness. They develop a panic because the sadness leads to morbid depression, which is what the enemy wants. He wants the addict to use drugs until he dies. The person knows they are always close to death, so they reach for more drugs to satisfy the beast so he won't kill them sooner. The beast is not satisfied by that, and they know that, so they become incredibly fearful. Number three, this fear leads to high adrenaline. If you ever want to see a person in a panic, tell them that their dealer is out of stock. Their behavior will turn to rage or let their town be dry and nobody has a way to get their fix. You will be dealing with a straight demon. The person is using because they're scared the boogeyman is coming. Satan. Satan is always threatening them with their unhealed wounds, their present pain. If you don't feed him, he will cast you to the wolves of your mind. They are avoiding the pain of their deep depression. Candida makes sure they are never in a state of well-being so they can always be triggered. They are terrified of not giving this demon what it wants. By the way, addicts see the world in black and white. It's either life or death. They use to live, even though they are dying in the process. If they don't get a fix, they will have to face their pain sober. And for them, that's as close to death as they've ever come. There are people that would rather be six feet under than deal with their pain. I wrote a book called God's Pharmacy, We're All Addicts, Dopamine, which I think you will find very informative. Here is an excerpt from it in chapter six, section four, called Dopamine and Spiritual State, because addiction is first spiritual. You can have a perfectly nice guy who wouldn't hurt a fly and you give him cocaine and that person will become a straight monster. Why? Because his system has been hijacked by the demon associated with cocaine. Every drug is associated with a demon. People that drink and use multiple drugs at once are trying to satisfy a gang of demons. They all want him dead. Here is another part I want to read you from chapter five, section five called Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome is a disorder where the person who is held captive actually begins to identify with their abuser, attacker, kidnapper, or perpetrator. They forget that they are a victim. They are now in alignment with their own destruction. They don't wanna be saved. They are marching to the beat of the enemy's drum, completely blindfolded. The truth of the matter is dopamine deficient people are marked for death. I'm not joking when I say that. They cannot handle life. They have become so demonically infested that if they don't get that dopamine, the demons within them will convince them to kill themselves. An addict is someone the devil carefully chose because of their spiritual weakness. He probably damaged them in childhood, so when they became of age, he could use that back door that remains unlocked to take over them. The devil would like to kill them in the womb. If not, he works on the parents to infect the child. If that doesn't work, he tries to get them in school through other infected children. If the child makes it to teenage years, he will surround them with demons to get them to go the destructive path. If they were already weakened from childhood, they won't even see the snakes surrounding them. They won't even see when they themselves become a snake. Out of everyone in the group, the devil will poison the one with the most potential to influence the world. 
The devil is not trying to keep people around that will tackle his kingdom. That's why they say the richest place is the graveyard. It's where talents, dreams, potential, and world changers that miss the mark go to die. The devil is walking around the graveyard with a victory flag because none of those people are coming back. The last part I want to read to you is chapter 6, section 2 called Depleted State, Dopamine Crisis. A dopamine deficient person never wants peace. Their demons don't want peace either. Peace is hell for them because peace means they will be with their own thoughts. That means they will become hyper aware of their infected selves and that's the last thing they want. If you happen to see a dopamine deficient person after they have already hit rock bottom and they haven't been able to get any energy at all, they will begin to harm themselves. Addiction is a form of self-harm. No, they might not be cutting themselves or beating themselves in the head, but if they don't get that drug, that will become their reality. They are possessed with an entity that wants to destroy them. Their self-preservation human code has been hacked. They have a spiritual virus and they don't realize it has permeated their whole cellular structure. They no longer can tell themselves from the demonic. Their thoughts are its thoughts. Their ways are its ways. Their agenda is its agenda. That agenda is to kill them. There are two types of drugs I'm talking about here today. Depressants and stimulants. Depressants take you down if you're too anxious, paranoid, or angry. Stimulants pick you up if you're too depressed, sad, or suicidal. Stimulants stimulate the central nervous system. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. Depressants slow down all parts of the body controlled by the central nervous system. Stimulants are meth, cocaine, crack cocaine, and MDMA or ecstasy. Depressants are alcohol, heroin, opioids, marijuana, or weed. Just like prescription drugs, illegal drugs have side effects. Stimulants cause insomnia, seizures, depression, violent behavior, suicidal thoughts, heart attack, stroke, heart failure, overheating, fever or hypothermia, brain swelling, brain bleeding, coma, hallucinations, delusions, psychosis, anxiety, panic attacks, and extreme agitation. The effects of depressants are insomnia, depression, high fever, sluggishness, sexual problems, slow brain function, low blood pressure, disorientation and poor focus, weight gain up to 100 pounds, difficulty urinating or inability to urinate. All addictions follow a cycle. Number one is a trigger, which could be anything, an event, a memory, a pain, Number two, this triggers a current thought such as I'm not good enough, my mother doesn't love me, I'm ugly, I'm never going to make enough money. It really doesn't matter because whatever the thought is, it's a lie because it comes from Satan. Number three, this thought triggers an emotion such as I'm hurting, I'm lonely, I'm sad, I'm depressed, I'm bored. This emotion sits on the person and depending on how much capacity they have for frustration, they will act on this emotion to get rid of it. Number four, the emotion triggers a behavior. The behavior is to get rid of the emotion, is to put the person in another state. They are uncomfortable. This behavior can be get a drug, go shop, go gamble, go sleep with someone. All addiction is the same. The enemy knows the person is already weak and he knows how to manipulate them like a puppet on a string. Number five, the behavior always comes with consequences. These consequences could be an overdose, memory loss, a headache, vomiting, waking up in someone's bed, spending too much money, having to apologize for what you did the night before, and of course, a paralyzing addiction. When the karma wheel turns around, the person will get triggered again and the cycle continues. There's a fine line between recreational user and full-blown addict. A recreational user uses whenever they have a drug in front of them. An addict always has a drug in front of them. It has become part of their daily life. The addict cannot face life without a fix. They go around this addiction wheel every single day. 
They don't want to face any type of emotion or feel anything. They are sprinting from their pain. This is the devil's finest work. If he can get the person to spin around so fast, they don't even see the repeating pattern. He can usher them into the hell of addiction, which is hell on earth. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the King James Version, it reads, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Addicts have a choice, change or die. They always have an escape, and that's Almighty God. He always has his hand outstretched. They just can't see it because they're in a deep state of delusion. God healed me thoroughly from severe drug addiction. I just got to the point where I couldn't take it anymore. I knew I was possessed from the inside and I wanted him to set me free. I hadn't talked to God in over 10 years. I was mad at him because I was in an abusive relationship and I felt like he let it happen. I disconnected from him and my life took a deep, dark turn that it would take me 10 years to get out of. When I thought God had left me, he was actually keeping me alive. I had a supernatural experience the moment I asked God for help. A light shined in my living room and God showed me a vision of where I was in hell. My living room turned into hell. The angel of death was floating ahead of me with no face. On the right side was the devil telling me to do it. I looked down and I was at the back of hell with one foot over. God let me hear the devil's voice and how for years I thought that his voice was my voice. The devil told me to commit suicide. I thought I wanted to do it to make my misery stop. I never wanted that. He knew I would be doing the work I'm doing now. So he tried to take me out of here 14 years ago. God was on my left side and he said, are you done with this? I said, yes. Right then I turned around and saw a light being walking into hell, unburned, coming to get me. I followed this being out of hell. I felt the devil on my heels. The next few months was pure hell because the devil knew he had already lost me. There is way more to this story, but I will have to save it for another time. There is hope though. 18 million people right now need treatment for drugs. Only 1 million of them will receive treatment. That means the remaining 17 million will remain loyal customers or die. When a person receives treatment for drugs, they need to detox first, which means to dry out, to get the drugs out of their system. They have to go cold turkey. But for people totally dependent, this could be dangerous. When drugs get into the system, it starts to rewire how a person's brain functions. There's a condition called being sick. It causes the hands to shake if the person can't get their fix. If you ever watch that show Intervention, you'll see some behavior similar to an exorcism when these people can't get to their drugs. A professional can help someone endure this phase of walking out of hell. I went cold turkey. I just stopped. Stopping isn't actually a problem for me. It's deciding to stop that was the hardest part. It's like inertia. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. An object at rest tends to stay at rest. When I was going, I was going. But when I stopped, I totally stopped. However, the withdrawals were something to deal with. The demons that I had already contracted were not going to let me go easily. They were going to make me pay because how dare I try to get free. I spent years in withdrawals, not chemical withdrawals, spiritual withdrawals. I had to face my pain head on. When you think of rehab, you probably think of something like one flew over the cuckoo's nest, where people are drooling at the mouth, walking around like zombies. It's not like that. They have some nice facilities, some even by the water. It looks more like a vacation destination. It's designed to make the person feel comfortable and stress-free. Stress is the reason why they're using anyway. There are counselors, activities, chefs, even massage spas. And most of all, there are other people that are suffering from the same thing. 
The worst thing for an addict is isolation. They feel they are going through it alone. Sometimes they like being alone so they aren't judged. They know they have a problem. They just don't know how to fix it. Or they're afraid if they take the band-aid of drugs off of their wound, they'll be too weak to face it. Addiction is a crutch and it helps the person avoid pain. In counseling, the person would have to face their deepest pain. They would have to go deep down into it all the way back to childhood up to the present day. They aren't doing it alone. They have dedicated counselors that will help them navigate the dark forest of their minds and to face the monster together. I didn't go to rehab. Sometimes I wish I did because the road I took was rough. It was just me and God. I spent four to five months in deep, deep, deep meditation. I left this planet multiple times. He did not give me a quick fix. As soon as I decided that I wanted out of the spiritual hell, the first thing he took away was suicide ideation. My anxiety was still there. My paranoia was still there. The aches and pains in my body were still there, but my emotional pain was still there. He took ending my life off of the table. This gave him the time he needed to work on me. Every single day that I meditated, demons were flying off of me. I had no idea how many there were. All the drugs I took, all the alcohol I drank, all the people I slept with, I had to deal with all of that. It was not easy. I thank God he chose me to save because many of my friends didn't make it. God knew that I would work for him the rest of my life, so he saved me. I can't thank him enough. I get teary eyed every time I think of seeing him walk into hell to get me. He could have easily said, no, you messed your life up too much. You turn your back on me, so I will turn my back on you. He didn't do that. He loved me through my mess and I love him forever for it. He could have handed me over to Satan, but he didn't. He did tell me one thing. You work for me now. If you ever return to that life, that same ledge I saved you from, I will put you right back there. He wasn't playing. People are afraid of the devil. I am afraid of God. I saw a documentary about Eric Clapton. He used to have a serious substance abuse problem. He was using everything. He got cleaned up and opened a treatment facility in Antigua, an island in the Caribbean. I'm not recommending any place because I personally have never been, but it looks like a top of the line facility. And if you need to get away from everything and everyone that plagues you, it is definitely a place I would consider. The most difficult part is making the decision to go. In a cloud of delusion, a person thinks they have it under control. Even though their life is burning to ashes around them, the enemy blindfolds them and keeps them in bondage. Once they make it through the doors of rehab, they have all the help they need to start the process. It's not one size fits all either. A person would have to really take the process seriously, reveal their deepest pain, walk through it so it can't be used by demonic forces when they get out. Some people stay for 21 days, 28 days, three months, six months, or even a year. Some people have a lot of pain to process. The worst thing to do is to enter rehab with an ego. If a person goes before they have an overdose, the process is much simpler. If they need to hit rock bottom before they admit they need help, that's not a person who was already in the right frame of mind. They have to acknowledge they have a problem first. Forcing someone to go doesn't work either. They spend so much time being bitter that they literally sabotage the process. This is immaturity. The counselors would have to chop down the ego before they could get to the root of the problem. The problem is ego. Ego is Satan. He will try his best to contaminate the process by hindering the person from delving into their deepest, darkest secrets. I think rehab facilities that focus on mindfulness and spiritual component are the best because they give tools that the person can use for life. Meditation is the greatest way to heal from any addiction. I'm just sitting here. I got time. It's clear to see. From up here, the world seems small. We can sit. Here is a questionnaire I found that can help someone self-diagnose 
if they have a drug abuse problem. If you answer yes to even one of these questions, you need assistance. Do you feel that you need a drug or alcohol in order to function? Is it hard for you to control your drug use? Is it difficult for you to stay clean for several days at a time? Do you use more than one drug at a time? Have you ever lied about your use of drugs? Do you ever use a drug by yourself? Has your drug use made you isolate yourself from your friends and relatives? Do you hide your drug use from your friends or relatives? Do you use drugs to cope with your feelings or to avoid dealing with the problems in your life? Does your drug use ever cause you to feel guilty, worried, trapped, lonely, sad, depressed, or hopeless about the future? Does your drug use ever make you confused, incoherent, disorganized, disoriented, or cause you some memory loss? Has your drug use caused you problems with motivation or concentration? Does your drug use ever cause you to have difficulty paying attention at work, school, while doing your hobbies, or at home? Does your drug use cause you physical, emotional, psychological, family, social, financial, or legal problems? Have your loved ones ever complained that your drug use is damaging your relationship with them, or do they criticize you for your drug use? Do you ever get aggressive when you use a drug? Does your drug use ever cause you to think about self-mutilation or ending your life? Have you ever ended up in the hospital after using drugs? Has anyone ever suggested to you that you go for a consultation to get help for your drug use? Has your doctor ever told you to stop taking your prescribed medication because it could be harmful to you given your use of drugs? If you answered yes to even one of these questions, you need assistance. The National Drug Helpline is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week for people who struggle with alcohol and drug addiction. The number is 888-633-3239. This is the first step at getting free. Addiction is bondage, it's imprisonment, but the key is always in the addict's pocket. The prison door is open. They are just not aware of it. God has his hand outstretched the entire time, ready to walk people out of hell. They just have to take the blindfold off to see it. He doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you. But he also doesn't have all day. We, I'm talking about myself too, all of us march ourselves into hell. We can't fight it alone. This is a spiritual battle first. We have to reach out our hands and ask God to rescue us. There is no other way to get free from Satan. Again, my way was actually pretty simple. These are the steps I used to get free from drugs. I was locked away in my house for four months, so I wasn't anywhere near going to rehab. My father in heaven had to come into my living room to save me. That's a hard road, let me tell you. The end result is something I can't describe to you here. If you want to take that route, you'd better get ready for a fight. Here are my steps to self-healing. Course of action. Number one, change your friends, especially the ones that do drugs. Number two, change your entertainment, environment, music you listen to, and media you watch. Number three, stop using and other addictive behaviors like drinking. Number four, pray for spiritual help with sincerity from God. Number five, listen to audiobooks and read self-help books. You should just binge on that. Number six, watch documentaries, biographies, and nature shows. Number seven, meditation daily, 30 minutes to two hours to music, not beat driven music. If you can make it up to two hours, 
something amazing will happen to you. Cleanse and detox your body with a vegan diet. Number nine, journal daily about your thoughts, emotions, and triggers. Number 10, retrace your family origins of addictions or deep family secrets. I myself walked up to the door of suicide 14 years ago. I was drinking heavily for three years, graduated to weed, then ecstasy, and did that every weekend for three years straight. Drank during the week, smoked weed every single day for five years, got on medication for depression, anxiety, and paranoia, stopped taking them, became suicidal, and finally got tired of it all and wanted to end my life. That's when God showed up. He saved me from the grave. I stopped doing all drugs and drinking. I have no desire for either now. He sincerely saved me from permanent brain damage. I finished college after that. I have written seven books. I became a life coach, a teacher, and a business owner. You couldn't tell me that that was waiting for me when I was in my drug haze. I thought my life was over. That was a lie from Satan. He knew what I was to become and he wanted to stop me. Well, it didn't work. My funeral was supposed to be 14 years ago and I am still here doing the will of God. The devil knows who to attack. It's usually God's best. I have two books that will give you the cheat codes to end addiction. They are both on Amazon. They are part of a series I call God's Pharmacy. That's my way of thanking God for healing me from drug and alcohol addiction. If I can help others, then he didn't waste his time saving my life. He did not have to choose me. I literally saw hell. I saw my death and he rescued me and he can do it for you. You can follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and join me over on Facebook. Stay tuned for part three of this addiction documentary where we cover sex addiction. Make sure you watch part one of this addiction documentary where we talked about alcohol. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And thank you for watching, and God bless you.